<laughs> but do me a favor and give me a little high five. Uh, if you uh, if you laughed, I'm going to put it back down again. I didn't tell you what you were high fiving when I said that. So everybody's hands are back down. If you laughed when you saw this kid's mug on the screen, did you uh, or did you smile at least? All right, that's what we're going for here. I I would like to, no matter what information I'm able to impart, and I try hard to impart things to you that are going to be good and value added, uh, and you'll be the judge of that in the next 35 minutes. Um, but I also want to elevate your mood. I want to elevate your energy level. Um, I've always found that I learned in my 20s, and that was a while ago, uh, that I was lucky enough to be born with the kind of mentality that sees the glass as half full. I immediately looked to the uh, the silver lining, and that's pretty easy, all right? When, you're, when you have a, a six-pack abs and you didn't have to do a sit-up to get them, which is what I was in my 20s, that was a long time ago, um, when you're young and the world is in front of you, when you don't have that many worries, i.e. kids uh, and families to worry about or even businesses to worry about at that stage, it's easy to be optimistic and I was naturally and I learned that it was really Anthony Robbins that was the first self-improvement um, guru, I guess you could call them, uh, that I, t I really dialed in with and spent a lot of time going through his body of work back then and I figured out that it's a skill that even if you're naturally attuned to it, it's a really important skill to know how to play with your own mind and reverse a negative mood, reverse a bad attitude, reverse being tired, being pissed off, whatever, to reverse it, to be able to snap and reverse it. And I always appreciated people and things that did that for me. Hitting the gas pedal on my car, especially hard, does that for me. Smiling in the shower does it for me. And this dopey looking kid right here, who I hope someday to meet, but I don't think I will because I found them on a Google search for dopey looking kid. <laughs> and this is what we got. So um, hopefully you found that interesting, or at least uh, you smiled when you saw it. So here we go. Um, the format of this webinar is similar to a radio show. Okay, I've got a few different segments. One of them is a little monologue in the beginning where I want to share some things with you and then we're going to talk about what's happening in the world of single family investment that maybe you're aware of or maybe you're not. Um, we're in different places every day, you and I, and I try to put myself in situations where I'm going to find out what's happening now or next and share it with you. So I want to be a fountain of current event information. We'll touch on that. And then <clears throat> we've got always new stuff, new tools, new technologies, new options for single family investors because the industry has gotten so um, advanced so quickly since the institutions got on board back in 2008, 9, 10, 11, whatever year you want to you want to pin um, as the beginning of this institutional institutionalization, easy for me to say, uh, of the single family investment market space. Um, uh, and I want to share some of those new things with you. Some of them we invented and developed. Some of them you invented and then we developed, and some are totally nothing to do with us, but we found them and want to share them with you. And I want to start with this idea of a point of view, POV. If you've been on this a lot, um, you know I talk about this. I try to keep it different each time, but it's a, it's a constant, consistent theme that, um, that every one of us has one, and being able to hone it down and understand it and articulate it and practicing articulating it, it makes you a um, more grounded person. It makes you sometimes a more interesting person if you have an interesting point of view and you convey it effectively. Um, and I want to share ours. Own America's point of view. There's multiple facets to it, but the um, I touched on, you know, at its core, this is an entrepreneur's playground. Okay? People misunderstand, I think, investing in real estate. Some of them misunderstand that as a speculation game, which it can be. Others misunderstand it as boring, which it is not if you do it right. Um, and they don't always realize how incredibly strategic it is because of how many people got into it with one or one of two business plans. Either I'm going to buy half-priced houses because I saw it on home and garden television or I saw it on late night cable uh, in an infomercial or I went to a seminar and I can get rich with no money down and, and, and buy half-priced houses. And that's a business plan. That's a frustrating one. If you get really good at it, it's a beautiful thing, but it's not the kind of thing. And that's like being a basketball player who only takes three-point shots, right? Everything is a long shot. Can't do a layup, can't dunk, can't even shoot from inside the line. 
and I hate basketball. I'm only saying it because I think some of you probably do, which saying I hate it kind of blew that whole ruse, but, you know, March Madness and all that. But low percentage shots, half-priced houses. The other business plan is I'm just going to buy a rental property or I'm going to be an accidental landlord um, and not sell the house that I moved out of last. Uh, and there are some services out there that want to keep people from really understanding what this is, not because they're trying to keep them from understanding, but because um, they want to make it as easy as possible. Services that say things like, we're going to make this, we're going to make investing in real estate easy. Well, it's not easy. Um, someday it, it might be, but given that every house is actually different, technically, uh, it's accurate to say they're all different. Even if two houses are built side by side identically, as soon as anybody moves in, the wear and tear starts a different track. And so it isn't easy, but it is highly strategic. And it's, it's in the execution and the strategy where the big gains are made. Now, a lot of people do really well just buying houses near where they live or work and sitting on them. And it's a very effective plan to accumulate one and then two, and then five, and then 10 rental properties, and sit on them for a long period of time. That works almost every time it's tried, but you don't have to be strategic about it, but it's not as fun if you're not. Um, uh, by the way, uh, I'm seeing some folks jotting things or just making some comments to me in the questions area. Please feel free to do that. Andrew, I don't know what you mean but before by saying before I forget. Oh, there you are, a couple of questions. Um, Anything that's kind of specific to your situation, I'll see if I can answer it for the whole group. Otherwise, you may have to take that offline. But in any case, I'm going to ask anybody here that wants to share some horror story or some success story or something that, you know, always bent towards uplifting, uh, exciting, something that excites you. Let's, let's make that today, that today is not about how something was difficult, but uh, today is about focusing on those things that have got you excited about it. And maybe... If you ask a question, I'll answer it um, um, if I have time for all of them. But also, I might unmute you. If you're interested in sharing verbally with the group, I can unmute you, and you can talk to them. We have a big number of people on this webinar right now. So I'm actually getting nervous with the number of people that are in here. Um, but no, I'm talking to you as an individual. This is like any good talk radio format. If you're a fan of talk radio, you know the host because you can't script. You can't even script 45 minutes, much less the two and three hours that some people do. Um, or four hours. Howard Stern comes to mind. Four hour show every morning at five or six a.m. You got to know who that man was because you can't wing it that long. Or if you wing it every day that long, you're just being yourself. So hopefully at the end of this, you get to like who I am because you'll come back then and we'll continue to snowball this. Our point of view includes the idea, um, in addition to single family investing being a highly strategic entrepreneurial play, it also is a highly patriotic one. And the reason I make that point is that I think investors were the heroes of the housing crisis. Um, I have the data to back that up. I'll just, I did it last week, so I won't do it again because I see a lot of common names here. But in 2011, that was when the housing free fall meltdown collapse ended. And it was not because home buyers believed. It was because investors believed. Home buyer sales were down 16% in 2011. Investor sales were up 65%. So investors healed, you know, the upward pressure on prices or the bottoming out of prices that happened in 2011, which is the official end of the housing crisis and the beginning of the recovery, that was to the credit of investors. And I get ticked sometimes when I see investors categorized or um, not categorized, labeled as villains because it's easy to pick on the landlord as a villain. And yet, what I saw with my own two eyes and what I was intimately engaged in on a large scale nationally with some of the big Wall Street investment firms was helping them acquire homes to create rentals in school districts where people needed them. All right? That's a beautiful thing. And maybe even, I wouldn't say more, but equally as important, I said it was patriotic. One of the things that I love about being surrounded by real estate investors is that we understood the housing market was going to recover. They can call investors vultures if they want, but you know what? When the home buyers were hiding under their beds, investors were buying as much as they could. And that was because they had unshakable faith, unshakable by CNBC, 
Unshakable by the Wall Street Journal, Unshakable by Dr. Schiller, who went on TV every day talking about how the housing meltdown was going to last the rest of his lifetime. There were days that I wanted to make that happen sooner rather than later um, because I got so sick of all the negativity. But you know what? Investors weren't deterred. Investors weren't scared. Investors knew a couple of very fundamental things. When you're buying real estate in the U.S., you are buying the U.S. Technically, you have property rights. When you're buying housing, you're buying the most fundamental unit of real estate, the smallest, the most granular unit. Right? It's a couple hundred grand or at least a hundred grand in most cases, but it's still smaller than an apartment complex, office building, or shopping center. But you are placing a bet in sustained demand for shelter in the U.S. So you're betting on three things. Population growth, right? Um, people are fighting over how to keep people out. I mean, it's the, the population growth is, is, is guaranteed in this country because it is a beacon to the rest of the world. It is the best place to live and raise a family by most measurements. Um, and so population growth, you have to believe it. You believe that people like to live indoors, which is pretty obvious. And you kind of have an understanding that when given the option, if, you, if it's a family, they want to have a backyard, they want to have a dog, they want their kids to have a safe place to play in the back. That's the housing market. And it was striking how many people forgot those three things back in 2006, 7, and 8. People that walked away from houses they could afford to make the payments on because they believed in the free fall meltdown talk. Investor didn't. They didn't buy it, right? Uh, they did buy it. In, um, in effect. So um, we have created this company around the premise that investors deserve better than what they're getting. All right? The, what's my next slide here? I think this makes, helps make the point. Yeah, neglected no more. Neglected no more. This, when I started on America in 2010, I had a pretty long, you know, couple decade long background in residential and commercial real estate, uh, brokerage and investment. And I believed the housing crisis would wind down, and I believed that the, there was no industry there to assist, okay? Realtors didn't have a clue about single-family investment, and commercial brokers don't have a, a care about being involved in houses. I mean, literally, to this day, commercial brokers say, we don't do houses. And residential brokers say, I want to sell you a home to live in. And stuck in the middle is the SFR investor. And I'm speaking, by the way, specifically SFR, the R is always included in our conversation. We're not a flipping organization. We don't get involved in discount properties. We get involved in accumulation of rental properties. So the R in SFR, single family rental, is a crucial component because it isn't about speculation. It's about wise accumulation, strategic accumulation. And what Old America did in our first couple of years was develop certification training programs and technology tools for real estate companies to be able to capture and service investors effectively. And after a couple of years and we certified over 4,000 people, um, we then saw Blackstone and Colony and American Homes for Rent and Silver Bay and American Residential Properties and Progress Residential and MS Renewal and et cetera, these large um, unprecedented home buyers in their essence, right, uh, emerge into the marketplace and we went after them because we had a national network of real estate practitioners that if you wanted to buy a few thousand houses, I wanted to sell them to you using our network. And we did that. And um, during the time when what we call the pie eating contest was taking place, where, in, where firms were buying as many properties as they could find in as many ways as they could find them, a lot of that was MLS, a lot of that was foreclosure. We were involved in the move in ready MLS side. And by the way, our angle was that if you show me a market with a lot of foreclosures, I'll show you a market with a lot of families that need rentals. And we keyed into not the distressed property side, but strategically finding places where there were five distressed properties, either underwater, short sale, or a facing foreclosure for every one rental property available in that area. When we found a five to one ratio, we knew number one, there were four families that were gonna get forced to move out of the school district, which sucks if you have kids. Um, uh, and number two, we knew that there would be sustainable demand for rentals because of a shortage of supply. Pretty obvious, but we were among the only folks that, that were thinking that way and not being seduced by discounted houses. We were seduced by rental demand that would drive up yields. Um, <clears throat> so we started that business and we have then 
um, converted to things I'll talk about later. But we we have built a technology platform and a series of relationships that we like to include you in, where um, people that want to acquire and sell occupied rental properties have a place to do it and have an industry to do it with and have partners that can help them do it. And the key there is occupied rental properties. Okay? They are not, they have not been a thing until recently. Right? Let, me, let me share what I mean. Um, and by the way, th th this picture, you know, neglected no more. The, the, the point that I'm making there is that as an industry, let me just show you something I think is interesting. I go to Google. I've been doing this demonstration for six and a half years where you go to Google and you search the term real estate and you see exactly what you'd expect to see. I'm going to see Zillow right there. I'm going to see Realtor.com right there. So I've got two of the three or four big portals on top and I've got um, a bunch of real estate brands. So here come the brands, Century 21, Remax, et cetera, and then some local real estate companies here. I'm in the Lake Norman, North Carolina area, just outside of Charlotte. So all is right with the universe, right? Here I put real estate and residential real estate shows up. But if I put real estate investing or investment or anything like that, watch what happens. Okay, investability shows up. Investability, friends of mine, they weren't even around three years ago. Um, ground floor, home union, realty mogul, investopedia. Where's Zillow? Where is Trulia? Where's Remax? Where's Cobalt Banker? Nowhere. Oh, okay, we finally got Zillow. So Zillow was on the first page. Good for them. All right. For years, we would do this demonstration to illustrate the neglect that we've got a market that was neglected. We've got the you know, National Association of Realtors says one in five real estate purchases are investors. So let me unpack that for you for a second. There are, you know what, I can support what I'm saying with data. So let me just do that real quick. So here's a chart that we have that just shows, um, it doesn't have 2015's number on this chart. I have this chart for all of the years, but this is the one I had on my desktop to show you right now. Wasn't planning on doing that. Um, between 20 and 30% of the home purchases every year are investor purchases. Okay, there are about 5 million purchases a year. So that puts it at about a million point two. So let's round it off. Let's say there's a million transactions a year that are investor purchases, all right? And one of the things that we believe from some of the research that's been done is that about 80% of those investors are buy and hold investors, not flippers. Even though flippers as a business gets all the attention because I guess it sounds like fun to get rich quick, the buyer and holders represent 80% of the transactions. So 80% of a million is 800,000. So hold that number in your head, 800,000. On the other side, the data indicates that there are, depending on who you ask, 16 or 17 million rental properties in the country. Why can't I pull this up? There it is. So these are all the, this is showing 17.6 million. There's a few properties in this first tranche that probably don't belong there. This is good data though. Um, and there's 8 million that own one property. See portfolio size. There's 2.2 million investors that own between two and five. There's 182,000 that own between six and 10 and so on and so forth, right? So we're talking about 17 million properties owned by 11 million investors. And as I just showed you, it's 2017, and when you search real estate investing, none of the incumbents in residential real estate and none of the incumbents in commercial real estate have bothered to put any content on their websites or buy any ad words so that when you search, so when you're 20% of the market and you're searching for rental property, you're not going to find anybody who sells houses because the residential real estate industry is the home ownership industry and commercial doesn't do houses. But check it out. Remember I said hang on to that number of 800,000? This is how crazy this vacuum is and how we'll talk about how fast it's improving. 16 million is the number that I usually use to indicate the total number of rental properties. This is 17.6 million because the folks that compiled this study included people that have more than one second home. So there's a few properties in here that are second homes. But all the stuff in green, those are um, rental properties. So you take 16 million 
as a total base of how many rental units are in the U.S. By the way, that's about 12% of all the households in the U.S. So this is, this is no market niche, okay? This is big. Um, this is a segment of the population that's huge. The 16 million, when somebody asked us to try to quantify what percentage of those turn over every year, we don't know. We don't have that data. So people say, well, maybe it's 5%. Okay, fine, it's 5%. What's 5% of 16 million? 800,000 is that number again. So when I go from the supply side, there are 16 million rental properties in the U.S. and let's say 5% turnover, that means 800,000 rental properties that are already rental properties are being liquidated every year. And on the other side, I've got a million transactions a year, 80% of them are investors who are buying, I'm sorry, a million investor transactions a year, 80% are buying to hold 800,000 units of demand that are buying, you ready, vacant houses. So these 800 homes are being vacated in order to sell them on the MLS, and these 800,000 homes are being purchased vacant and turned into rentals. What is wrong with this picture? And what's wrong with this picture is the industry of realtors has ignored and neglected the SFR market basically until now, but even now I showed you the Google search. They're not even attempting to go after it right now. So what does that mean? That means that if you're in the real estate business, you've got a big opportunity, but what it really means is um, if you're an investor, you are part of that neglected class. You've had to figure this out for yourself, all right? And maybe you've gone to an investment seminar, um, and maybe you've read a book, but you didn't walk into a local real estate office and figure out how to do this because they needed to figure it out before they could show you. It has been a vacuum. And what's happened in the last several years it is it's gone um, miles and miles, light years forward, um, than where it was before in terms of the tools, techniques, technologies. You see, when Wall Street gets involved in something, they have to basically blueprint it. Okay, They can't raise billions of dollars for a new asset class unless they're, they've got people who are willing to take a risk, but you can't do billions and billions and billions unless the first billion worked out. Right? Makes sense. So when the first pioneers in institutional single-family investment got into the space, I know they literally walked out there saying, okay, we, want, we have a billion dollars, we want to buy several thousand houses, who can help us? And they heard crickets because nobody had really been ready for that. The, there was no industry. There was just a vacuum. And so they built it themselves. They had to build the acquisition systems, technologies, techniques. They had to build the analysis. They had to scrub the data. They had to figure out um, how to find the houses, how, how to find the markets, how to choose that how to find the houses and choose those, how to acquire them, how to get them under control, how to renovate them as they needed, how to rent them out, and how to get them into a management system that could actually produce the profit. And back then, there was a lot of naysayers, more than not. A lot of people who said it can't be done. Right? We could put a man on the moon in the 60s, and we can carry an iPhone in our pocket, but we can't cut 5,000 lawns. Oh, no. Right? So there were a lot of people that I thought <clears throat> came out and stepped out and said it can't be done, and then, like clockwork, it got done, right? Every institutional investor that attempted it succeeded at it, trial and error, figured out how to find, acquire, operate, manage, and now the billions, the billions are flowing. Right? We always knew they would because I own rentals. I know people who own rentals. You own rentals. It isn't easy, but it also isn't rocket science, right? You're buying an asset that's in demand. It's a hard asset that will appreciate. All right? And I don't want to hear about how prices came down during the meltdown. That was a correction, and they've gone right back where they belonged ever since, and they're climbing again now at a pretty, um, probably a little too fast, actually, for me, but um, still very encouraging. Um, at the end of the day, what was proven was that they are not unmanageable. They are in demand, and without the technology and the data and the professional MBAs and all that stuff, without that, everyday landlords across the country were earning yield, even though they didn't call it that, and were generating HPA, price, home price appreciation, even though they didn't call it that. All they knew, and they didn't know what the percentages were because there were no calculators. Nobody was showing in the math. They had to figure it out themselves or just rest easy that if you buy houses in a good place and you keep it rented out and you keep the tenants happy and the properties appreciate, you will end up later on in life much better off. You buy three of these things and you're going to retire much better off than you would have otherwise. 
I saw it my whole life. I didn't have to know what the numbers were to know that when it was done on a grand scale with the benefit of that data and technology and low cost financing and MBA's brains on it, that all that happened was the truth was revealed under the Wall Street microscope. And the end result was Wall Street liked what it saw. Okay, So when I searched my little slide software here for um, the word neglect to see what kind of icon, I found this picture of a kid falling into a bucket of water. So I guess, I guess that's a, a, a parent who is neglecting their child, but I thought it was funny. And as I said in my opening, this is all about making you smile and getting you motivated and hopefully giving you some good information. So the kid falling in the bucket of water, don't be that kind of parent. Um, <clears throat> what else do I have here? Okay, so the point of view is it's never been better to be in the single family investment space as a small investor because guess what? All the stuff that got invented for the big guys, including stuff that we invented for helping them identify markets and analyze markets and properties, the property managers who worked for them, the data providers who worked for them, the Re renovation companies who work for them, the leasing companies, all the things that were needed for Blackstone and the guys and gals to do what they did by 100,000, well between them it was like 240,000 houses or something at this point in a very short period of time, all the professional management systems and data and technology that were needed were hastily invented. I know everybody that did that is saying, I've got something here that everybody can use. Everybody who's interested in investing right down to the first time investor, or in, in our focus has really been the more experienced but smaller entrepreneurial investor, but everybody deserves the best data, the best professional management systems, the best practices that the industry has to offer. And by the way, I know that a lot of investors that are doing it on a smaller scale, they figured this stuff out long before Wall Street MBAs did. All right, so there's a lot of knowledge that have got, has gone up the pyramid to the biggest capital source um, investors, the large cap investors, that they thought they knew everything, but they really uh, learned a lot when they interacted with people, um, like, kind of like us, that were able to channel the knowledge that was gained by the rugged entrepreneurs out in the field, and then package it and share it with the big guys and help make them look smarter. All right. So here's some examples of that. Um, you know, I was talking about the idea of there's 800,000 units of demand and there's 800,000 units of supply only the supply is being vacated in order to sell it and this is true folks we're the we're the leaders at selling portfolios of rental homes in the country I mean here's our site we sell portfolios of rental homes you're here because you came to there so you're on this webinar because you registered on our site at one point we are the market leaders we're not that big yet but we're the best because we're the only one so we're also the worst but um, we're getting good at it, right? And we're figuring it out. It's a very nuanced kind of a project. Um, but the thing that was the most striking is that we are based in North Carolina. We got people all over the country contacting us. Since 2014, we began doing this, um, doing the portfolio sales, calling us from all over the country because they looked for somebody to help them sell their portfolio. Like, great example, a guy who had 135 rentals in Florida found his way to us we had a 30-minute conversation I said I'm looking at your spreadsheet thanks for sending it it looks like a junk pile of foreclosures to me not because I can see the pictures because there aren't any pictures it's a bunch of addresses in a spreadsheet that looks like what's called a tape tape is terminology in the non-performing loan or foreclosure world of a giant pile of shit okay a bunch of properties or loans that nobody wants that are deeply discounted, excuse my French, but you know, Friday. The, the tape is usually the, the wrapping of a discount product. And we told this investor, what are you doing? Like, you need to package this. You've got rentals here. You've got tenants living in these properties. You have a performing rental property. So like, for example, nobody has any trouble understanding why a fully occupied apartment building is better than a vacant one if you're looking for cash flow and wealth, all right, and low risk, which most investors are. Nobody has any trouble wrapping their brain around the idea that a fully occupied office building shopping center is advantageous as compared to vacant ones or partially vacant ones. And yet, when this guy in Florida contacted the brokers locally to him, 
um, he was told vacate the properties because I asked him after 20 minutes on the phone. He said, "Okay, I want to hire you guys." I said, "Okay, great." So I sent him the agreement, and I said, "You know, before you sign it, I have to ask you, why are you doing this? We're 750 miles away from you. We don't have an office in your town. You're supposed to have an office in town. We don't have one. Um, we don't have a track record in your market. You're supposed to have a track record in the market to get a 16 million dollar listing. You're supposed to have a track record in the market." We've got a local broker we can share this with so that we've got all the compliance things in place, but you're supposed to be on the ground in the real estate business. Why are you coming to me and signing an exclusive engagement to list a $16 million portfolio with us when there are people down there local to you to have all those other th fundamentals in place? And his answer was they want me to vacate the property. And so we began asking that of everybody. And the answer was always the same. They want me to vacate the property. I'm in North Carolina. Look how much stuff we have in Texas for sale. Why aren't they going to the local brokers in Texas? Because they're told you have to vacate your property. So there's 800,000 sellers of, of occupied property that vacate them to sell them, and 800,000 buyers that buy different properties. Sometimes it has to be the same properties, but they vacate them first. It's insanity. There's almost a perfect match between supply and demand, but the supply is being stripped of the cash flow before it meets the demand. That's how bizarre. I showed you a Google search. It's bizarre. I explained this to you about this miss. 800,000, 800,000 should be a perfect fit. Nope, they miss each other, right? The occupied rental property is a thing now. People are acknowledging, especially from the institutional side, they don't want to buy. We had somebody in the office just before the webinar started from a major, major institutional player who said they're only buying occupied properties. When they were buying vacant properties, it was killing their numbers, killing their numbers. So they only want to buy occupied. So that in itself is an innovation, that if you're going to build a rental portfolio, accumulate rentals, not vacant homes and turn them into rentals, you're free to do that. But it's been proven, again, through the microscope of Wall Street, that if you can buy occupied cash flowing properties financially, you will be better off. You'll never know how much except that now you will because you have the same kind of calculators that they have. So that's the first innovation, all right? Another one is the financing, all right? You're probably aware that it's become easier and easier because it used to be horribly difficult to get financing on rental property. But there's good news, even better news, because there were a number of players that came into the space over the last several years hearing the call of the SFR industry being invented and they created loan products. Uh, they're good, but they're a little bit expensive compared to home buyer products, but that's the way it goes. But something's at foot right now in Washington. There's an article right here I just want to share with you that Freddie Mac is following suit with Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae backed a big deal that uh, when, when Invitation Homes, which is Blackstone's SFR REIT, when they um, went public just recently, uh, maybe they haven't even finished going public, but either way, Fannie Mae gave them a billion dollars of backing for that. And what Fannie Mae's executives have said when they were criticized for, for helping fat cats, their answer was, number one, this is housing for affordable housing for families that choose to rent or need to rent. So there is not just fat cats involved here. There's a lot of customers living in those portfolios that, um, that need those rentals and choose to be there. So in other words, don't throw that do-gooder nonsense at me. We're trying to do good for the little guy by providing liquidity and low-cost financing for investors. They started at the top, and what they said was they wanted to understand the market. And the best way to understand the market, where it wasn't just one market, but 20, and it wasn't just one property, but it was thousands, uh, was to work with the biggest so they could get a feel for the risk. Essentially, that's what it's about. What is the risk quotient for uh, within single-family investment? And then Fannie Mae says they're considering, considering backing single-family rentals. And what they're saying is it's not just providing insurance and backing to the big guys. They want to provide it to everybody. Right? And now HUD is starting to show signs of being in the mix. Why is that important? Because HUD offers loans that are still below 4%. Fannie and Freddie are probably right about 4 That's a big deal. If you have the ability to, to acquire property – with Fannie Freddie HUD financing, that means you have the ability to walk into any mortgage company 
in town and say, I'm an investor and I want to buy this rental property and then that rental property, uh, or I want to buy these 25 rental properties in a portfolio, those loan programs are coming. It's a watershed moment for the investor market. Like we know, for example, that FHA, which does not make loans, single family loans to investors, did from 1935 to 1989. When the markets crashed in 89, they pulled that, or I'm sure they, they inserted that regulation, that restriction that investors were not allowed to use HUD financing. And it was political. It was people saying investors shouldn't make money. All right, they totally forgot about the fact that the investors are going to lease the thing out to a family who probably is a low income family or at least needs affordable housing. And if an investor can buy with a 4% rate today instead of a 6 or a 7% rate, they can afford to charge less in rent. So low cost financing does accrue to lower cost rent. So it is good for everybody. But what's even in some ways more exciting to me is not the individual single family mortgages, but actually the multifamily mortgages are being adapted for uh, portfolio buyers. So if you want to go buy a $2 million portfolio of you know 18 rental properties in your area, um, I believe shortly you're going to be able to use an FHA multifamily loan to do that. Okay, buy the whole thing, wrap it up in one loan. And by the way, in all those cases, it's the rental income that is used to qualify the mortgage more than the borrower's employment income. All right, watershed moment. The housing market was really created. The market was created in the 60s when Fannie Mae was created. Okay, when there was a market to sell um, mortgage-backed securities, and that evolved over the years. Um, it, it caused the, the, it enabled the masses to own homes. Now it's going to able, it's going to enable the masses to invest in this splendid asset class that helps you build wealth, right? More and more and more people are going to be able to do it because A, you can buy occupied properties that already have a tenant in place and are already cash flowing, taking a lot of the questions out of the equation. B, you can get great financing for it. And then C, there's this awesome technology around of which I, I, I'm going to include on America, but there's others. There's investability, there's roof stock, there's home union, and there's more that are coming that are giving you access to the kind of calculators and technology and insights that the institutions have had the benefit of that were really built for them and now being made available to you. So I want to give you an example. Um, what this website does, by the way, is that if you're an owner of rental property, or you're somebody who has an owner as a client, you're a property manager, you're a lawyer, you're a title company, you're a realtor, you've got a client that has a rental property portfolio, they are able to enroll their portfolio for free and get a free valuation. And the valuation looks a little bit like, I wanna pick something in a particular place because I'm gonna make my next point in Houston. So here's one in Houston. So what the system does when you upload your portfolio is it gives you calculators. And you can monkey around with the calculators. Watch the way the calculators change your net yield, your cash on cash return. It gives you home price appreciation. That index is the 20 year average annual price appreciation for the portfolio. It's not the case Shiller index says that home prices are up 3.21% compared to yesterday. No, it's not that. It's a 20 year average for the portfolio. And so you can bank on the fact that if it's ridden the last 20 years, so from the 90s, tech boom, tech bubble, 9-11, wartime, peacetime, low rates, high rates, housing boom, housing bust, it's ridden the market. Here it is down here. This is the chart that shows the United States in blue, the state of Texas in black, and the portfolio in green. Okay. You can look at this and you can say, not only do I know what the average is, the index, I can see how it compares to the state and the country, so in this case, better, and I can see how it dealt with the stress test of the last 20 years. Did it skyrocket like like um, uh, Phoenix and then plummet and then catch back up again, or was it steady eddy? In this case, it was steady eddy. All right, so that index is baked in here. So as an owner, like I know that almost nobody knows what the average appreciation rate is for their market. You can know like that. Enroll a property, open an account, plug a property in, and you'll see just that one property gives you all these analytics. Um, you've got projections here of cash flow, projections of equity. You get the map of the portfolio. Owners love that. 
it's all interactive. You know, you can throw down your street view and zoom in to the local market and see the house. You've got individual property level analytics in here, so you can look at each individual property and crunch numbers on it. Here's that price appreciation index. And then we've got population and migration. We call these market fundamentals. I think everybody does. So population change. Now, the reason why I chose Houston, there are, um, there's a lot of people that make decisions based upon headlines. Let's see if I can actually find this headline. There was a headline, Houston real estate market in decline. Let me search that, see how many results I get. Layoffs and uncertainty taint the real estate market. Takes a hit. Houston real estate. There was this Houston business. Is this the one where they show people in the restaurant? I forget. There was story after story after story about how Houston was crap in the bed. Okay, um, and the reason was the gas prices were down, oil was down, and of course Houston is synonymous with oil, right? It's an oil uh, city, and so if the oil industry is going to contract because prices are going to contract, well then obviously Houston's a bad place to invest. Now. We had clients that were actively looking for portfolios in Houston that said, we're pulling out of Houston. We don't want to be in Houston anymore. All right? Why? Ah, well, because the headlines, the stories, there was this one degree connection made. Oil down, Houston bad. Like, duh, right? Okay, that's all they had. I don't mean the clients. I mean the reporters that were reporting. There was story after story after story. And I was looking at it and saying, well, wait a second. I've got my chart here. This is this was back in 2015. Okay, so forget about this last jump in prices. This is where right here, where all this was going on. 2014 into 15, the market in Houston is for crap, and I'm saying, well, geez, you know, this there's a lot of crazy things that went on during this period of time, and it was incredibly steady and resilient despite all that. But let's move on. This is population change. This is people who need shelter. Right back to what I said before. People want to live there. They want to live indoors when they get there. Not any indication whatsoever that anything changed when the oil prices went down. In fact, oil prices have been high and low along these last 20 years, and you just don't see anything except for once in a while a bump. So steady and then bump and then steady and then bump and then steady. So I'm saying to myself, I don't care what the headlines say. I'm looking at something that doesn't appear to be changing. Migration patterns, same thing. More folks moving in than are moving out. The unemployment rate. Harris County, Texas, it was coming down. 2014 and 2015, when it was supposed to be massive job losses, it was actually coming down, the unemployment rate. All right? I mean, everybody would say the state of Texas is the job capital of the country, and yet the unemployment rate was going up at a time when the unemployment rate in Houston was going down. So, again, it doesn't jive with the headlines. But here was the kicker, the job diversity chart. This shows you the different... Um, what do they call them? I forget. The, the codes that within which they classify, the classifications of the different types of industries, and this counts up the jobs by number of payrolls. Trade, transportation, utilities, 20.6%. Some of the utilities thing is the oil industry. But then you've got professional and business services, totally diverse. Then you've got education and healthcare. Okay. Then you've got government. Government in fourth place is great. When you see government in first place and healthcare in second place, eh, not, that don't always love that. But when you see transportation, trade, utilities, and business all in front of government, and then watch, leisure, hospitality, manufacturing, construction, financial activities, natural resources, and mining. That's the oil drilling business, the one that was supposed to collapse and kill the Houston real estate market. Is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth largest category right ahead of other. <laughs> okay? Other. What does that mean? It means the headlines were wrong. It means the data and the visualization of that data told the true story where the experts in the media were telling, I don't know, just lies because it sells more papers to depress people. We know this, right? So, but why do we still believe them? In this case, it's very hard to refute. Until we started telling clients, I just want to show you something. You're telling me that because the oil drilling industry is taking a hit, the whole oil drilling, in, drilling industry could go away, and it's not going to hurt Houston because Houston's got a diverse employee base, employment base. All right? These are tools and technologies that weren't available before. 
all right? And we this is just our version of it. But the idea that you can, I'm going to be wrapping up soon, so I just want to give you a, a suggestion of what I'd like you to consider doing if you want to get the most out of this. People, by the way, are figuring out cool ways of using our technology that we weren't even intending. Um, we're happy they're doing it. When you log in, you come to ownamerica.com and log in, you're going to see your dashboard. Your name's right here. You're going to see your dashboard. If you go to your dashboard, you have the ability from anywhere on the site to upload a portfolio. There's instructions there. You basically create a portfolio. And what I've been telling people to do is that if you don't already have one, if you have one, put yours up. It's free, and you can put it on the market if you want, but you don't have to. 94% 90, of the portfolios on this platform aren't for sale. We're creating technology to help you own smarter, help you build better. And one of the things that we've told people is that if you don't have um, the portfolio to put in here yet, create a sample. I did that right here in Charlotte. This is a sample of properties in and around the Lake Norman area. I just picked properties off of Zillow, and I added them manually. And what it did is it created a fantasy portfolio for me. All right? So five properties. I put the asking prices in, and our system gives it a valuation. So the asking price is at $1.14 million. The robot thinks it's worth $1.1 million, just about, so it's pretty close. As you'd expect, right, a 3 or 4% distinction between asking price and market value. The calculators are here. I can see that this sample, this random sample, runs at just shy of a 5% net yield. The price appreciation for the market is just shy of 3 so this is an investment that would get me a 7.85% without any mortgage leverage on it. If I dropped $1.1 million, I would generate $57,000 in income, and it would appreciate every year at a rate of about 3% because that's what it's done for the last 20 years on average. I can count how much equity I would have in this fantasy portfolio. Uh, actually, that's cash flow. Here's equity. I want to say I want to retire in 15 years. So how much income am I going to have from this portfolio if I keep it paid off? 80 grand a year. Let's say my rents are going to go up faster. Let's see what that does. Change the 2.5% annual increase in rent. Watch the chart adjust. All right, now it's 87,000. <clears> Let's say instead of paying cash, in 15 years I'd have equity of $1.7 million instead of the 1.1 that I put in. That's pretty sweet. But let's say instead I used a mortgage. So I put down 50%. All the numbers change now. Okay, based upon 50% leverage. I can update my chart. Watch the blue chart. The mortgage balance now folds in in the black. So I can see if I only used 600 grand plus closing costs to buy this portfolio, 50, uh, 550 grand to buy this portfolio with half of a mortgage, that 550 grand now becomes. $1.3 million over those 15 years. I can plan my retirement. Why are you investing? I want to fire my boss. Why are you investing? I want to retire comfortably. Why are you investing? I want to get wealthy. I want to build my own fund. I want to take other people's money and create wealth. Whatever it is, these are the kind of tools the professionals use to put their assumptions in, in assumptions that are informed by real hard data, and then watch the way that stuff grows. Now, what I will tell you is that a 6.5% return, um, actually that's because I put leverage on it. It was actually closer to 75 or 8 You can't do that without taking a lot of risk in most asset classes. But here are five houses surrounding Lake Norman just outside of Charlotte that I can do a 5% cash flow return, about 3% appreciation per year, and if my goal is to retire turning my half a million bucks into a million three, here's a way to do it. And you tell me, is that a risky play? It's not a risky play, okay, as long as you keep your eye on it. Another element of our point of view is that this is entrepreneurship. It's not investing in stocks, okay? This is not E-Trade, right? It's not supposed to be E-Trade. In my opinion, people that are building services that tell you we'll take care of everything, you can be totally passive, are selling you short because it's fun. I find it exciting to pick winners. Right? You may not want to go outside your local market, but if you're willing to go outside your local market, you can look anywhere in the country and you can research. You can say to yourself, I read the Panama Canal is expanding. What does that mean for the ports in the southeast U.S. now that larger ships can come through the Panama Canal? 
Well, let me go look at Jacksonville. Jacksonville story is massive hyper job growth and population growth because of that exact story. A major southern city pulling population from the north and seeing a, a, a long-term sustainable boost in jobs because of something tangible happening, which is the expansion of the Panama Canal. That's cool stuff and you know it, right? And when you can read and think and figure out where the people are going and why they're going there and whether that's going to continue, that um, means that you're using your own personal intuition and your own skills and a lot of data and technology to do better than the market, right? And to be more engaged. And it's important to be engaged because it's when you take your eye off the ball that you screw up. And so better to know what you're doing uh, or be figuring out what you're doing and learning what you're doing and not, um, not just putting your eggs in somebody else's basket, right? Carry the basket yourself. All right, so again, this is Charlotte, same kind of idea as Houston. All these southern cities are kicking butt when it comes to job growth and thereby population growth and then thereby demand for homes, which means higher rents and higher values in perpetuity. Okay, so I'm, I keep this to an hour max, and we're going down to three minutes. And so um, I've got a couple of questions I want to look at here. Um, the data, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to upload right now. You know, I can't do this. I have a phobia of trying to upload. I can drag and drop it. Okay, so that, that data that I showed you before, this chart, the green one that had the – come on, let me drag and drop. And it's not letting me do it. All right. Um, what can I tell you? You want to see – that data came from a, a source called Rent Range, but just so you understand where it came from, when you record a deed – Okay, when you buy a piece of property, you're going to tell the, you know, the title company when you close what address you want your tax bill to go to. And then, of course, the property itself has an address. And um, if you live here or you get your mail here and the property is there, that's an indicator that maybe you're an absentee owner. If there are 25 places, 25 addresses that your mailing address is the same on, in other words, there's 25 places where the addresses are different, but they all have the same address where the tax bill gets sent. That probably means you're an owner of a portfolio. And if you're not a bank or a credit union or a builder, developer, or a government entity, we screen those categories out, and we are highly confident that you are now a portfolio owner. That's where this data came from. It's public record scrubbed in the fashion that I just told you. Okay. Um, the question uh, Wesley's asking me in the calculator I just showed you, when you add leverage to a portfolio, is the annual equity buildup factored into the rate of return metric? The rate of return metric right here is the cash on cash return plus the annual home price appreciation. Okay, we only have one metric, year one snapshot, where the rate of return combo shows. These charts down here do not give you a rate of return. We're actually working on that as a third chart, but right now it just shows you what your cash flow is and it shows you what your equity buildup is. And what will happen probably by June, there will be a third chart that shows internal rate of return. All right? And it's, it's the, the beauty of it. I'm glad you asked, Wesley, because the beauty of it is when you, when you start messing around with this stuff, you begin to see an interplay between, like, for example, I've got just about a 5% net yield. That's my income on the properties divided by the price of the properties. And I've got a mortgage rate of 5%, so my debt is costing me not much more, but more than what my yield is. So my cash on cash return, in other words, the amount of money that I sunk in compared to how much I'm pulling out is actually lower than my net yield because my financing, my financing is too expensive. So let's say just as an example, I show you what happens if I put a 4% loan in here. It grows. Let's say there's no 3% loans. Let's say I put 3. Okay. What happens is the cash on cash return climbs as you go, and then thereby the rate of return climbs with it. I can't get into that much detail here, but we're going to do this kind of stuff every Friday. All right. We're going to use the calculators. The things that I've learned about the way real estate performs um, accelerate when I monkey around with these calculators and see the way they change the outcomes. You say, oh, so what if I did 70% loan to value instead of 50? What does that do to my numbers, right? And all that is not necessarily intuitive. Real estate investments, and I've got 
no minutes left. So real estate investments have three drivers. The cash coming in minus the expenses, so the yield. The use of leverage, so using other people's money to purchase more property. Um, and as the property values go up, the amount of return you're getting is larger because you're putting less money in play, but the property value is growing in real dollars. And the third one is appreciation. Those three things together are what drive wealth creation in the housing market. They can easily get north of 10%. Um, and nobody had ever really had the capability to look at those three things in concert with each other, change the assumptions, test the assumptions, watch the way the outcomes change, and then make your decisions not based upon, well, here's a mortgage, here's the rate, here's the payment, and then take a calculator or a spreadsheet and figure it out on the side. Instead, now you have the ability to save these assumptions, learn, feed your brain, become the smartest investor you can using these tools. Okay. Um, any last questions? Um, one last one, Andrew asked, what is the minimum net cash flow we look for in SFR? Um, I don't, you asked about a dollar figure. We don't use a dollar figure. Andrew, um, our clients are mid and large cap investors. Um, they are typically satisfied. They're happy with something over a 6% net yield without appreciation. So figure with 6 and 3, you're at 9, 3 being the appreciation. They're happy with the 6%. They're suffering through 5 and a halfs and 4s. Um, no, I shouldn't say that. 5 and a halfs and 5s. And we even have some that are willing to buy something in the 4s. And what's happening, and then I'll close, that's so interesting, is when the institutions first came in, they were all going to the same cities. They were all doing kind of the same. They were buying the same kind of stuff. There was, a, there was I wouldn't say it's group think, but there was a consistency among the investors that all said major job cities, newer houses, median prices, et cetera. But now there's something new that's happened. That, there was a very dense jungle that nobody had ever traversed. And the institutional trends, we were part of it. We were out there, we were hacking through the jungle and clearing a path. That was that process of being doubted by some of the big money people and some of the, um, meaning the institutional pension funds and critics on Wall Street and the media, that when we hacked our way through this thing, we were just a, a, a bit player in the whole thing, but we were part of it. Hacked our way through, then we cleared it, then we paved it, then we put easy pass tolls on and we put exits and hotels and restaurants and fast food and rest areas. Now it is a smooth multi-lane highway, okay? And a lot of capital is flowing into it now. Some of that capital is after something different. That they're less concerned about a 6% yield and more concerned about appreciation. So Miami is open to them now and DC suburbs are open to them now and San Diego and Seattle are open to them now where they weren't before. Because those are, those are markets you can't get that high of a yield, but they're gangbusters markets in terms of a robust economy, right? Overseas investors, money coming in from China, right? No question about the fact that Chinese investors, primary concern, capital preservation. They're getting it out of China because some countries do have a track record of nationalizing things and making it impossible through mandate for you to get your money out. So while they can, they want to get it out, and the best place in the world to live is the rooftops over the families in the USA. And they don't care about yield. Some of these folks are buying luxury apartments in Manhattan with no yield. They're keeping them vacant. They're letting their college student kids live there. They don't care about the yield. They care about the capital preservation. Well, a portfolio, a $10 million portfolio of rental properties generating a 5% yield or, excuse me, a 3% yield which would not appeal to Blackstone, but would appeal to an overseas investor where any yield at all is great. Just give me a big piece of a resilient market like maybe Seattle, Washington, or uh, San Francisco, or DC. All right, so I'm over time, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Give me a little high five. Tell me if you, I mean, you're still here. So if you're still paying attention, you haven't gotten to sleep on me, or you're checking your email. All right, I got a bunch of high fives. That makes me feel good. I appreciate it. So have a wonderful weekend. You've joined this webinar, which means you're going to get a reminder each week because you signed up for one. You're signing up for every Friday. You can obviously undo that anytime you want. But touch base with us every Friday. All right, pop in. I'll try to keep it interesting. 
try to bring you new things and um and thank you happy you're here happy friday